Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I'm a Finnish industrial designer here in Japan, here in Osaka. And um, I'm going to talk about 3D printing. But first, um, let's touch upon the subject of building things. So just about building stuff, making stuff. How many of you think about, when you buy something, when you buy a product, how many of you think, of you think about how it's made, like not like where it's made, but like how the material, how how it's actually brought to the shape that it is. How many of you think about this kind of things when you buy something? Okay, I see two hands, three hands, a couple of hands. So, not not a lot of people. Um, and this, um, I think that um, nowadays. Uh, people do not understand anymore how things are made. Um, hundreds of years ago, or maybe even just still like 100 years ago, a lot of people would make their own tools. They would make a lot of the things that they need for their everyday life at home. Now it's a different thing. Your, the products that we use are made somewhere else. And um, let's say that... I'm, uh, the TED presentations that I've seen, they always start with some kind of an argument. So I'm going to make an argument here. If you would like to make something this day, you would like to produce some kind of an object that you need, that you can't find at a store, for example. My argument is that you're not able to make it. You can't probably produce it by yourself. And that's the spot, that's the, the state of... Uh, Thing, th the state of things that we that the world has come to, and that will eventually distance us from the objects that we use every day because we don't understand how they are made. And um, so, this is something that I made when I was two or three years old. Um, it's um, it's a camera. It has three holes that you can look through. And they represent different zooms. So like the one in the middle, the one in the middle is like the, the, the normal zoom. You can look through it. Um, on the top you have the, um, I guess, the, uh, the tele. You have, I have these uh, two walls that are in this sort of a tapered, tapered uh, fashion. The one in the bottom is probably the macro. So you can look at something small. So this was... I made this as I was like probably three years old. I used a really sharp knife, cardboard, and glue. Here's another view of it. And um, okay, it was crude, but hey, I was free. Okay, there's me again. And this was again like maybe like four years old or something. I, I, don't, I have no idea anymore, but I made a laptop. And okay, I put the trackpad on the on the left side next to the keyboard. I didn't put it under the keyboard, but okay, it was. But there's a trackpad, and here we have the keyboard, and there's a screen. That looks looks pretty much like something that we have this day. Although I did it like in the beginning of '80s, so probably like '81 or '82 when I made this. And um, so I've been making things always. Here you can see an older me. Here I'm making a, a model, a mock-up for a, a transportation design project for an airline, for a Finnish, Finnish airline. Um, so here I'm using plastics. Still I'm using uh, workshop tools to create this. So this is still along the lines of something that everybody can do. But if we want to do something out of plastic, we need to go to the factory. So this is a product of mine that's made in, uh, in a factory in China. It's an iPhone case. And uh, here it starts to go where no longer we can make this by ourselves. We can't do this at home or near, near the house anyway. And uh, here, 3D printing. So this is another object that I've made recently that's completely done by myself. You could argue. Um, the, the end product, which is a physical object, is 
completely printed. This is the way it comes out of a printer. It's plastic, you can touch it, you can put color on it. And um, this is going to revolutionize the way we make things and perceive the objects that we use every day. This is from The Economist. I'm going to read this loud for everybody. So, um, it is impossible to foresee the long-term impact of 3D printing, but the technology is coming and it is likely to disrupt every field it touches. This, this was in The Economist uh, this February, this year. Something very important happened in 1985. Um, well, a lot of things happened in 1985, but um, one that still impacts us every day, I would say every one of us, all of us, most of us, every day. The laser writer came out, the Apple laser writer. Finally, an affordable printer <laughs> for 7,000 USD. But it was an affordable printer. Now, basically everybody, a small business, a school, or individuals were able to print something that looks nice. And in connection with the page maker by Aldous that came out shortly after this. Before this, you were distanced from prints, from 2D prints. You had to go to somebody who can make you a nice print. You had to go to somebody who has either software or some kind of letter set fonts or or a printing machine or something. Now, basically everybody could start making prints. And um, this revolutionized a lot of things and finally democratized the, um, the, the free printing press, so to say. Something happened again in 86. The world's first 3D printer came out. So there was a guy called Chuck Hull. He invented a technology that he first called solid imaging. And then he named it stereolithography. So stereolithography is a, uh, you, have a you have a pool of uh, liquid and you have lasers. And lasers are cool. And with lasers you can, you can harden parts of that liquid and that liquid becomes solid plastic. So now, all of a sudden, you were able to print 3D objects, objects that you could touch. And he started commercializing this technology, and now, these days, we have a bunch of 3D printers, but the printers are still ex quite expensive. You're looking at a, uh, you're pretty much looking at an in in investment of uh, 10,000 plus dollars, or a nice car. But, there's something called the MakerBot, which is an open source bot for make 3D printing. Uh, one of the, the people who founded this, uh, this, uh, this open source movement is a guy called Ray Pettis. He used to live here in Osaka in the 90s. Uh, so I, I want to ask him sometime if he, uh, he was somehow inspired by Osaka for making 3D printers. Here's what they look like. So here we have a nice, uh, you know, like a uh, printer that everybody can have at their home. You know, it's an Next to it is something that um, would be the size of a maker bot or some commercial small desktop 3D printers. So you're looking at the size of a sort of like a hotel mini bar. Next to it we have this tre treasure chest shaped thing that's already a bigger, little bit bigger printer. It's for a certain type of material. And then we have these huge refri refrigerator sized so, with, with 3D printers, you still have the problem of size and price. But it will, it will change. In the future, it will change. And how does 3D printing work? Very quickly and roughly. Here we have a layer of powder. The powder can be plastic, it can be metal, titanium, gold, silver, nylon, all sorts of different materials. Then we have a laser, and the laser hardens a certain area of the layer. 
And once we've hardened that part, we just put another layer on top. So then we have more powder on top and then we use the laser again. And we get an object that is made out of layers. So here we see Death Star. So you can basically make a, uh, you can make objects that are layered and depending on the, the, uh, the quality of the printer or the material or the laser, you get a nice resolution or you get a poor resolution. The resolution is getting better all the time. Nowadays, we can achieve something that we can basically sell as a final product. It already looks so nice. So let's see what the next slide is. Okay, so let's make something. So here we have a uh, here we have an object, and um, I just wanted to make something as an example. This would be impossible to make in a factory with traditional molding techniques, because you need to make a mold and you, you need to be able to open the mold after you've injected plastic into the mold. You can't open this kind of a mold, you can't get that out of the mold. But let's say that we need this kind of a part, and I need this kind of a part for a project that I'm working on. So now I'm just, you know, I'm just working with this, this, this one part for a project and making uh, prints of it. And I have one here, and I'm just going to pass it around so everybody can take a look at it. So, this is something that would be impossible to make using traditional uh, methods. Also, if I would make this in a factory, I would have to make thousands of them to, to basically justify the cost of the mold, if it would be impossible to even make with a mold. Here we have another completely impossible object. Just a bunch of interlocked rings. Serves no particular purpose, but <laughs> it looks kind of, kind of fun. For your baby. <laughs> exactly. And um, then um, also, for last Valentine, I, I made these unbreakable hearts. <laughs> there's no, you, you see, there's, it's, 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 it's like one part. They move, but it's like it's printed as one thing. So there are no seams, there are no, no glue lines, nothing. So it's a, a romantic, unbreakable heart. And the, um, the, the object that I showed earlier. And often the designer gets an idea. And he or she starts sketching the idea and making 3D renderings. But unfortunately, that's often where the idea stops. As soon as you, have, you want to make it into a real object, that's where it kind of stops. Unless you have a budget, unless you have a workshop, unless you have a factory, unless you have a client who wants to buy the products after you produce them. Now with 3D printing, you can just print it out. You can print one, or you can print a hundred, you can print a thousand, it doesn't matter. So what if... Um, what if we had a 3D printer in every home? And I believe that one day we will have a 3D printer at every home. For, se for example, when the laser writer came out, still people were, say people were saying that nah, people are not going to have printers at their homes. Now pretty much probably everyone in this room has a printer at their home. So I truly believe that in some way or form we will have easy access to 3D printers in the future. And um, even, we, will, we might even have them at our homes. And that will revolutionize the way how we buy things. We will probably buy digital downloads. We will buy downloaded objects and print them out when we need. Companies will have uh, samples. You can print out samples, basically to try out something. Manufacturers can give you spare parts that you can print. And okay, we are still doing this kind of stuff at home, so we maybe think like, okay, that's probably not gonna happen, but, but the same thing was with the 2D printer, with the, with the normal paper printer. People were not thinking that everybody would need one, but still we have those, everybody has those. So, this will, what this will mean for designers, more opportunities, also, traditional manufacturing will not go away. 3D printing will supplement that. So there will be 
3D printed objects, there will be objects that are made with traditional methods, and um, basically more selection and more choice. Um, designers can have open source designs, they can work with open source objects, people can modify those, you can do a lot of creative things with 3D printing, not just when it comes to nice things, also in uh, medicine, construction, um, all sorts of uh, fields of life, just like The Economist magazine said. So, um, manufacturers do not need to fear 3D printing, designers do not need to fear it, consumers do not need to fear it, because ultimately it will thrive human creativity and make the objects that we use more intimate for us and we will not settle for less than we want. At the moment, because we don't know how things are made, we often settle for less. 3D printing will thrive human creativity and make things very fun. Thank you. All right.